In this tutorial, I want to introduce the basic idea of Jones vectors and how we write some mathematical expressions for them. The basic idea is that you've got an XYZ coordinate system and you've got some sort of polarization state that we want to describe in a propagating plane wave. Now let's consider what a basic plane waves expression would look like. We'd say that the electric field at any position and at any time is prescribed by the following. Well, we're going to choose the particular case of a beam that's propagating in the z hat direction. So it's going to have this sort of dependence on space and time that's going by e, K, e to the i kz minus omega t. So that means that the propagation direction of the light, like the shining direction of a laser beam, is going this way. So we know from previous considerations, the electric field in free space then can't point in the z-hat direction. The electric field only oscillates in some combination of the x-hat and y-hat directions. And that's why I've drawn this little yellow square here to sort of say that we're confining the field to this plane. If we sit at any given point in space, the oscillations will only be x-y. So let's make that most, the most general that we can. That's going to be an x component ex pointing in the x hat unit vector direction plus an amplitude of ey oscillating in the y hat direction. So this then becomes our most general expression for the electric field in any position and time. Now, when we actually talk about Jones vectors, we use a lot of shorthand. We, we bury a lot of stuff. The first thing that we bury is we, break, we take this e to the i kz I'll, I'll bracket the kz there. We're going to imagine just sitting at one point in the beam and looking at how the electric field oscillates within this plane. So we're not going to pay attention to the space dependence of this beam. And we're just going to directly talk about what the electric field looks like as a function of time only when we're sitting at a particular point in space. And in that case, we chuck the e to the i kz dependence So we only have the vector direction of the field left, like this. We're just bringing that down from above. And then the temporal variation is just e to the minus i omega t. So that's the electric field as a function of time at a particular place in the beam. So, we do, so that's a little shorthand. We, we know that this is the time variation of what is overall a time and space variation of a beam, but we're talking for the moment just about the variation at one place. And then we kind of know that e to the minus i omega t is how things are going to vary in time. So we can mentally staple that onto an expression in our head and not actually write it out anymore. And we actually adopt the convention of simply saying that the electric field as a function of time equals and instead of writing this vector out this way, we're going to write it in linear algebra form. We're going to write a vector as two numbers, ex and ey, like this. And the convention, of course, you can see is that the top number corresponds to the x component of the vector, and the bottom number corresponds to the y component of the vector. So now we have this very shorthand notation for the polarization state of this beam even though really we're talking about a plane wave permeating both time and space. But here we've extracted the crucial components that describe how the X and Y fields amplitudes and possibly phases are different from each other because these can be complex numbers. So this is called a Jones vector, this thing right here. And let's just do a couple of examples to get familiar. There will be future tutorials that work out some more consequences, but some examples. Well, let's first of all, let's draw this yellow square sort of head on, make a dot in the middle there, you can sort of think of this as the x axis and this as the y axis as we're staring at this thing. And we can think one certain possibility would be having the oscillation along the x hat direction here. So that state, that would be a linear state of oscillation. So one example of a linear state would be a one zero state. That would correspond to this oscillation. Certainly another example would be a vertical oscillation. That would be 
a 0, 1 state. In general, if the oscillation direction is like this, if this is the polarization, we can notice that this makes an angle theta with the x-axis. So that particular state I'm sketching over here that has a, when, it, when its x amplitude of oscillation is cosine theta, its y amplitude of oscillation is sine theta. And notice that the linear states 1, 0, and 0, 1 are just particular choices of theta from this more general expression. So these are all cases where EX and EY are both real, and so there's no phase difference between the two. So when one component is maximized, so is the other. Another possibility is a state you've all heard of called circular polarization. And this would be a case when the X, compared to the X case, uh, polarization, the Y component is pi over 2 out of phase with this with it in this case it's lagging by 90 degrees this can be written of course as 1 i i like to think of it as e to the i pi over 2 though because that really drives home the fact that we're multiplying by a phase shift of pi over 2 sometimes multiplying just by the i kind of gets a little more abstract and you're not really sure what it means now one thing i want to further drive home about this is that Unlike all of these three vectors, which have a unit, which have a length of one, they're all what you would call unit vectors. One i has a length of root two. And it's a good idea to take the length out in front separate from the vector and say that this is this vector is equal to root two times one over i divided by root two. So what I would say to you here is this is the unit vector for, for one-handedness of circular polarization. And this would be root 2 saying that we have a, a non-unit amplitude of that circular polarization. The general expression for a polarization state would be to have some real number e naught x of amplitude of x field and some phase phi sub x, an equivalent expression for the y component. And this would be the most general form of what e sub x and e sub y are. They have a magnitude and a phase each. But there's some, some things, importantly, that we would simplify about this. The first thing is that this doesn't have unit magnitude. In general, e naught at sub x squared plus e naught sub y squared doesn't equal 1. And so what we'll usually do is extract some e total, which is the geometric sum of e naught x and e naught y. Like if these are the two legs of a triangle, of a right triangle, this would be the hypotenuse length. But we also don't really care about this phase e to the i phi sub x. Because when we talk about polarization, we're talking about a movie of how the electric field is oscillating in time. We don't really care at what point in the movie the movie starts. So that's sort of like a global phase is free for us to choose as we want. So we choose that phase that the x term generally has, as, has is a real number. When we extract these two things out, this allows us to write the Jones vector. The top number will just be e naught sub x divided by e total. See, I've got e total and e total here, just like I have root 2 and root 2 here. But now if I look at this Jones vector here, I've just written the top component of it, but you can see that this, uh, this top term doesn't have magnitude e naught sub x anymore. It has magnitude e naught sub x divided by e total. 
Now the y term is going to be e naught sub y times a phase term, which has to make up for the fact that I pulled out a global e to the i phi sub x. So it's going to be e phi sub y minus phi sub x. And this is the most general expression then for a, a Jones vector. I'm putting a red box around this to say this is the unit vector for a, for a general case. It's guaranteed to have unit amplitude if you choose E sub total correctly. It only pays attention to the phase difference between the Y component and the X component because the global phase is not something we're usually paying attention to. Of course we have to keep E total out in front if we're keeping track of an actual electric field because we may care about whether a be one beam is twice as strong as another beam. But this term, we generally will drop that. In most physical situations, we don't ever care about the global phase. There will be cases where we do, but often we won't even pay attention to that. And so the most general expression is an overall electric field magnitude out in front, and then a unit vector over here where there's some phase difference possibly between the X and the Y terms. And that's the entire story for introducing Jones vectors. The last thing to do is to bring over a little MATLAB GUI and just demonstrate a few things to you. I've got an expression here, e to the minus i omega t times a certain amount of x hat component, which is currently zero, and a certain amount of y hat component, which is currently one. If I play this movie, I get an oscillation that goes up to down, which makes sense. If I pause it and I add the same amount of X component that I had of Y component, they're in phase with each other, so the X component will be maximum when the Y component is maximum. Can you predict what this is going to look like? It goes at plus 45 degrees. These, the blue line and the uh, cyan line are, are telling you how, what the X and Y components separately are doing. I don't want you to think that, that it's required that the two have the same magnitude. I could make only half as much X as Y, in which case I would get this. Let's think about that circular polarization. If the Y component has an extra pi over 2 of phase, here I've typed 0 0.5, and I play this, the Y component is now going to maximize a quarter cycle later than the X component. So I, so I should see the X, the blue projection be big, and then quarter cycle later, I will see the magenta cycle be big. So the arrow should, the red arrow should be here, and then go to here. And that's of course what it does. I can show you the path, it traces out a circle, that's why this is called circular polarization. If I change this to negative 0.5, I change the lead to a lag, and the polarization starts to go in the opposite direction. We'll talk more about elliptical polarizations in class, but these simple examples give you a general sense of what some of these simple states look like.